Becky Stern, and welcome everyone to the Food Business School's Food Biz Plus, our uh, speaker series. The, I'm Kathy Joran, the director of the Food Business School here at the CIA. And the Food Business School is the Center for Graduate and Executive Education here at the Culinary Institute of America. Our mission is to enable and empower our students to design, deliver, and lead transformative innovations that address the world's most pressing food systems, excuse me, challenges, and its greatest business opportunities. And we do that through a variety of programs, one of which is our Food Biz Plus webinar series, which uh, you're joining today. So we're thrilled that you're here. And uh, just to let you know a little bit about, about the format, I'm going to introduce today's speaker. We're going to have a conversation with him for about 45 minutes. And afterwards, if you wouldn't mind staying for just a couple minutes, I'll let you know about a new program here at Food Business School and also the upcoming uh, Food Biz Plus for January. So at this point, I will begin our introductions of our guest speaker for today, who is Phil Calicchio. Phil is a co-founder of law firm Taylor Calicchio LLP, and he has represented the interests of over 100 food and beverage professionals, more, of, more than 50 of whom have become James Beard Foundation award-winning chefs, restaurateurs, beverage professionals, service professionals, restaurant designers, and authors. He has advocated for chefs to secure individual financial reward in exchange for sharing their hard-earned intellectual property with hotels, resorts, restaurant investors, and product manufacturers by structuring and negotiating long-term management and licensing contracts. After years of focusing solely on representing the talent side of the food business, Mr. Clicchio expanded his services when he formed Clicchio Consulting, LLC, bringing his experience, reputation, and deep culinary relationships to the mixed-use retail and hotel development sectors. Just this month, Mr. Clicchio embarked on yet a new path. His Clicchio consulting firm was acquired by global real estate leader Cushman and Wakefield, and Phil now serves as the executive managing director of Cushman's specialty food and beverage, hospitality and entertainment division. Perhaps a testament to the importance that food and beverage is now playing in the development and redevelopment of retail, office, and mixed-use real estate communities. Phil focuses on the techniques required to successfully identify, select, negotiate with, and engage high-quality food and beverage operators, as well as on the hotel, excuse me, on the latest operational keys to successful food hall development. He also advises professional and collegiate sports venue operators and large-scale music festival promoters on strategies geared toward elevating their food and beverage experiences. Phil's credentials are extensive. We are so fortunate to have him with us today for Food Biz plus the Food Hall Movement. Today, more than ever, entrepreneurs who care about current and future challenges in our food system are forging ahead with rapid innovation of a new food service concepts and new food pro retail products. The food hall is not a fad, not a trend, it is a full-fledged movement. Let's talk with Phil about this movement. Welcome, Phil, and thank you so much for joining us. That was quite an introduction. <laughs> be proud. Well deserved, well deserved. And we're so thrilled to have you here with your expertise and experience and to talk about Food halls. Well, so maybe exciting, start by it's exciting to work with the Culinary Institute of America every day. So um, it's, it's an honor for me to be uh, to be part of the program. Thank you. Thank you so much. I I also want to mention that Phil is actually a professor in our new master's degree program, which I will tell you about at the end of our conversation. But we're so excited to have have you join that program as a professor as well, Phil. Thank you. So let's talk about food halls. Tell us first, what is a food hall, and, and maybe uh, give us a little definition of it. Yeah, you know, one of the one of the great things about food halls is that they, they kind of defy definition, which uh, I, I think makes them uh, even more exciting in a lot of ways. But if if we were going to put uh, some type of parameter around it, I think what we would say is that they are multi vendor food and beverage uh, providers under one roof 
um, usually containing a uh, coffee type of component, uh, and say often a food or rather a, a beverage component like a bar or a wine bar, and then various other artisanal type of offerings that are uh, that are part of the uh, part of the experience. So what wouldn't be in a food hall would be a, a McDonald's or a Sabaro. Rather, we, we, we'd much prefer to see food halls made up you know, of regionally uh, celebratory cuisine. Excellent. I love that term, celebratory cuisine, <laughs> versus a large-scale chain uh, right. that you might find outside or in other locations. Okay, great. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the history of food halls and the current development of them. Well, the history uh, of food halls uh, you know, goes back to the cavemen. Uh, you know, it's uh, it truly, there's always been a desire for human beings to, to want to commune and congregate. And, and of course, food uh, has forever been the thing that, that people gather around. Um, we can trace food halls today, the food halls in America, you know, to the central markets of Europe and Asia, um, where uh, under one under one roof or in one environment, uh, a wide variety of, of vendors uh, of, of all kinds of things, prepared foods, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, retail items, clothing, you know, um, all gather in one area, and it became a place to see your friends. It became a place to experience what was new, to trade news. Um, food halls are really not much different from a conceptual standpoint today than they were a couple thousand years ago. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we definitely see that when we travel around the world and experience the wet markets in, in the kind of cities that you're talking about. You're exactly right. And if you travel, even if you travel locally in your region, you're likely to find a food hall today that is either uh, has either been operating for a couple of years or is about to open, because we've seen such explosive growth that you mentioned it in your opening comments that no longer can can the food hall be considered a trend or a fad. Um, it has it has all of the earmarks of a movement. And it's a good movement. Very exciting. And how do you see the evolution? Um, how how many have there been? How many are there today? And what do you see happening with the growth of yeah, them? Yeah, I, I have a standing joke about that. I say, what time is it? Because in 10 more minutes, another food <laughs> hall will, will open up somewhere. But um, at the beginning of this year, there were about 100 50 food halls operating in the U.S. By the end of the year, there'll be 200. By the end of next year, there'll be 250 to 275. Um, five years ago, there were less than 10. Um, and when you think about that, uh, it, it's, it's that kind of growth doesn't happen unless the community the consumer wants it to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. Food is not being forced on anyone. Uh, but what is being forced on, on producers and providers of food experiences um, is, is authenticity mm -hmm. and excellence. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can talk about why that is as we go through. But, you know, our, our world right now, our American world, um, is certainly much more knowledgeable about food, the, where it comes from and how it's prepared, uh, and how they'd like to see it, uh, frankly, uh, assist them in their relationships. I know it sounds a little high pollutant to say that, but, you know, food experiences are currency uh, among a lot of people, and, and that currency is... It, it, is, is is honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For the most part, it's really honest. Mm -hmm. Well, that certainly applies to those of us associated with the CIA and probably everyone who's listening to us now because food is, our lives pretty much revolve around food. 
<laughs> and our relationships, etc. Yes. 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 Um. So is is this kind of growth what you see as defining this as a movement? Yes, uh, but I think I think it's an overall movement that that uh, I think Food House capture a part of what uh, we'll use the phrase millennials here. What what the, the the generation that are referred to as millennials practice? Um, they don't preach very much. They practice. They vote with their feet. You know, and the the food hall provides variety. The food hall provides a bit of excitement in terms of in terms of how the offerings are constructed. Um, it certainly provides a community where you can uh, go with your friends, with your family. Uh, people can experience different things and then sit down at a at a communal table if they choose um, and uh, be able to compare notes and also just just be friends. Good for business meetings, good for collegiate conversations, all kinds of interactions. Uh, I can tell you that I think I've seen uh, I've seen everything from you know a couple of get engaged in a food hall, you know, to, uh, I'll probably see a couple of get divorced in a food hall at some point. <laughs> but um, really, what happens is you, you're almost compelled to engage if you're in a food hall um, because you're you're able to watch other people. Uh, enjoying their experience. Um, what's that person? It's the same thing we all do in a restaurant, whether we whether we intend to or not. When the when the wait staff comes by with a dish that you didn't order, you sort of mm-hmm. follow it to the table. And, you know, you make a story up in your mind about the person who ordered it and and, and why they might you know why they might have selected that dish. Uh, in a in a food hall, you get to do that in spades. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. By the way, I'm not dressed in my food hall uniform today. Um, <laughs> we had had a few other work things to do. Usually, usually when you see me, I'm not wearing a, wearing a three piece suit. Well, you always look very, very nice. <laughs> so, tell us a little bit about how food halls have impacted the commercial real estate market, since that's an area that you've been very active yes. in. So, one of the reasons I'm sitting here at uh, 51st Street and uh, Avenue of the Americas on the eighth floor, as you can see behind me, uh, is is that food and beverage as a whole has taken on, on a significantly greater importance to commercial real estate development in the United mm-hmm. States. Um, some people refer to it as the amenitization of real estate, um, but it flows from the same rationale we just talked about. That every every space now that is being developed uh, is first concentrating on the amenities that they can provide to their prospective occupants. Uh, food leads the charge, and mm-hmm. by that it, it is it is absolutely demanded by. Uh, well, if I say the word tenants, what I really mean are the people who work for the companies that occupy the space, mm-hmm. um, and. Companies want to retain talent in an environment like we're in, and one of the ways to do that is to provide them with a workspace that is not Spartan, that is not uh, desolate, but rather that can provide them with uh, uh, additional quality of life. And Mm -hmm. real estate developers weren't thinking that way even four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's it's, it's 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 been a major change. Food halls have also taken on probably an unfair responsibility um, of creating halo effects for the developments in which they are uh, they are opened. So many developers uh, believe that if we first create a food and beverage experience like a food hall, um, all of the surrounding area is going to improve because of this new community asset. Um, and that's true with the, the sort of the reimagination of shopping malls. Um, as we all know, right, the way we the way we as Americans shop has changed dramatically in the last five years. Um, thanks in no small part to 
what Amazon does. Um, so what has that done? Well, that has had to make real estate owners reimagine how to make their their space um, people friendly again. Mm -hmm. And the most yeah, the most honest way to do that is through food and beverage, and mm -hmm. through food and beverage that is less from a, a corporate environment, but rather closer to the artisanal things that we you know that we like to think about. And, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, because the traditional food courts at shopping centers weren't gathering places, really. They're just places. No, to no, they reminded me a great deal of, uh, of, of, you know, of, of prison cafeterias. <laughs> you know, um, the the idea of a food court was not to not to create community, but rather to refuel a shopper. Uh, or give the shopper a place to kind of drop their kids for a while, um, mm -hmm. while they so they could go back and shop. Mm -hmm. Food and beverage is now the retail itself. It's not it's not it's not uh, a gateway to the retail. Food and beverage is the retail. Yeah. And we see that with uh, if we look on, on a writ large with Italy and how uh, how important Italy has become as a template for real estate development. Uh, it's fascinating. For me, it's fascinating because I've gotten to work with so many talented chefs uh, and restaurateurs, and now I get to work with the, these brilliant real estate developers and, and the, the talented people who work within that environment, and I see that their approach to food and beverage is, is so, I guess the best word I can say is uh, so resolute. They they actually realize that this is this is not just any sort of fad, and that mm -hmm. everything that these um, people in the real estate community are doing relating to development is featuring food mm -hmm. Good mm -hmm. time to be good time to be involved. In it. It's an attraction in itself, exactly. Very nice. And so, is there a typical organizational structure required for a food hall? Well. Uh, from a developer standpoint, uh, most developers would love to have a single tenant come in and negotiate a lease for 30,000 square feet of space and have that uh, tenant improve the space uh, into a food hall and then curate the different vendors, manage the venue, um, and, uh, and reap, uh, reap uh, great profits. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in reality, the the number of groups that are well capitalized enough and experienced enough to do that are small. Mm -hmm. uh, all the unicorns out there, uh, and so that means developers have to become more creative. And one of the things that we do uh, is is help them conceive structures mm -hmm. in which the developer will build out the food hall, and mm -hmm. instead of trying to create a tenancy. They will do is engage. Uh, we're going to sell parts of the world. They just called an asset manager, um, but we view it. We call it a venue, a venue operator mm -hmm. that can uh, that can manage all of the day to day that is required for all the common space that exists within that food hall space. And mm -hmm. by the way, the only the only rule that seems to be consistent is that about fifty percent. Of these total square footage of food hall is common area. Mm -hmm. So that means, let's say 10, 10 vendors operate out of 200 or 250 square feet, um, and they have a, a communal space uh, of potentially 5,000 square feet for people mm -hmm. to go mm -hmm. and, and dine. So when we structure these things, we, we structure them in that. Environment. The vendors don't sign leases if we have anything to do with it. Rather, we structure these things as license arrangements, mm -hmm. where they have a, a short-term, relatively short-term, couple of years, uh, right to to uh, do business within a space that is owned by another person. That's mm -hmm. where the venue operator comes in as a very important component. Uh, the venue operator will will be. Uh, track of all of the sales, um, 
these uh, these things work best as as non cash type of uh, environments, uh, and uh, that's a, a development that we're seeing uh, a, a lot of activity on is whether or not being cashless is as democratic as the food halls intended to be. So uh, we try to think about all of all of what makes the food hall more attractive to people. And um, while being cashless is easier on the operator, it's not always easier on the public. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, that's definitely true. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot to think about. It. We, it, it's, it's sort of like my, my, my dad uh, was a fan of Joe DiMaggio. And my dad used to tell me that the greatest thing about Joe DiMaggio was that he made everything he did look effortless. And it took tons of work and years of practice to make what he did look effortless. But make sure that now we know we're live. Right? Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in order to in order to make what you do look effortless, it requires years of practice and um, and effort. Uh, food halls and restaurants are very similar, right? We, we want to give the illusion that it's all a blessed accident and that these things happen magically. But those of us in the industry know how much work it takes to do that. Yeah, most definitely. Okay, so we have a question that came in and it actually rolls right into our next topic, which you know we wanted to uh, talk about the critically important keys to success of a food hall. And one of the topics was uh, about the location. You know, is it important for a food hall to be in an urban area versus a suburban area? Uh, what or what size of a metro area is necessary to to support a food hall? That that is a that is a great question. It's a question that we try to attack on a on a, a case by case basis. Um, we've seen food halls as large as a hundred thousand square feet. Developed by Time Out uh, magazine uh, has gone very, uh, very strong into food halls, and they like to do them on a very large scale. Uh, we've seen them as small as a couple of, you know, five thousand square feet, and we think about that in terms of like, where are they going to be positioned. It's it's easy to think about a food hall as a success in a in a high traffic area like Manhattan where there are three or four food halls that surround Grand Central Station. Um, <laughs> and so that's, that's an easy kind of thing to conjure. Um, the next, I think, question that, that, that we have to think about is, well, if, if we take the food halls into the suburbs, for instance, um, you know, are we, are we thinking that we're going to have the same type of foot traffic? Well, no. But what we are going to have is the ability to program a space that is built around the food hall. And so that space should, if it's designed right, curated right, be something different at 8 a.m. than it is at noon. Um, at 4 o'clock, it's going to be different than that. And at 8 p.m., uh, if we design it right, it's going to turn into a performance venue that mm -hmm. is still going to have some food and beverage available, um, but we're going to be able to program that space so that we can have music, we can have podcasting, we can have uh, art exhibits, we can have uh, cooking demonstrations, we can have magic shows. Uh, by the way, don't laugh at magic shows. They're a huge seller <laughs> right now. I'm sure. And uh, the idea, though, that this space can be created and developed um, so that it can transform itself at different times of the day is really exciting. And it wouldn't be doable without without it be being a food hall first and foremost. Right. Well, and so who takes charge of that design and curation? Is that the venue operator, the overall operator, or is that a group we, of uh, that's a that's a great question. What we do in our business is advise ownership on how to team build and have mm -hmm. a Sometimes it's 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 as basic as starting off with what's the concept going to be. Mm -hmm. and helping the developer formulate the concept. Um, other times, if they've got a more mature idea of what they think they'd like to do, um, you know, we have a group, for instance, a group in, in um, you know, in Atlanta that is in a, 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 
area dominated by Korean Americans and Korean American businesses. Well, we, we, we know we want to celebrate that, right? So we know that we're going to be going going into that with uh, with an eye toward that type of food product. And so it's a little bit, um, then it's taking and honoring a region, a neighborhood, and trying to make sure that we can give them the type of, the type of cuisine that they that they know that is going to be popular, but also introduce some things from near the region uh, to make it a little bit more exciting. Mm -hmm. um, from a standpoint, and I'm, I'm looking at one of the questions that came in, what size of a metro area do I feel might be necessary to support a food hall uh, demographic? Um, I'm bullish on what food halls can do as accelerators to communities. And so I try less to think about whether or not will this food hall succeed as a food I think more about, will this space be able to succeed as a community venue mm -hmm. if I program it right and design it right? Mm -hmm. The food will support it, and the food is going to continue to keep people um, interested, uh, keep them engaged. Um, but I want this thing to be, I want the food hall to be really be uh, a cornerstone of community. I think mm -hmm. most people. They don't say it. You know, I mean, they, they think about it. They think about oh, the food, the food, the food, and mm -hmm. and and often they're simply not leaning back for a moment, soaking in the environment that they mm -hmm. found themselves in, um, and, and recognizing that that I've got a moment away from my computer, I've got a moment away from my device. Um, I uh, there are other human beings here. This is good, and they're enjoying what I'm enjoying. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of yes. Reminds me of hawker centers in Singapore, right, where everybody eats all Very the time. So. And, Very uh, much so. Yeah. And and if we had the kind of population that is sort of attacked like we do in Singapore, um, you know, I think we'd see even more of these. Mm -hmm. um, but we are seeing uh, neighborhoods in in different parts of, of cities. Uh, and suburbs, you know, our, 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 the great gift of, you know, of immigrants that we have here uh, in the U.S. exposes us to so many different cuisines, mm -hmm. and, you know, we see that uh, if, you're, if you're like me, uh, you're fascinated with how important food and sharing of food is to the different immigrant cultures, you know, that, that uh, you know, that maybe we can go back as far as you want let's just say in the past 20 to 25 years, mm -hmm. um, where would we be, be without Korean mm -hmm. you know, Today, the New York Times uh, issued its best of 2018 lists in the food section of the paper. Um, best new restaurants, eight of the 10 were Asian. Oh my goodness. Right, eight of the 10. Yeah. Um, and out of that eight, Seven were Japanese. We think about that kind of thing and, and the richness that we're seeing from, from mm -hmm. different cultures. Um, those are perfect, perfect things to complement the food hall. Mm -hmm. um, because part of it is giving you something that you're comfortable with, and part of it is challenging, challenging mm -hmm. you to take another step. So. Nice mix. And so when you're talking about that, um, it kind of speaks to the importance of the different features of the different tenants that you assemble for a, a food hall. And uh, I know we've talked about artisanal, and now we've talked a little bit about different types of cuisines. Are there other important uh, properties or things that we need to think about when we're looking to our mix of tenants in a food hall? Well, um, when you when you ask me. I guess that's what you're doing. You're asking me. Um, <laughs> we believe we believe that that you should first default your thinking to excellence in, in your region. What in your region is um, is worth celebrating and uh, and important to your to your region. Now there are some parts of the country where um, 
we can take that to another level. Um, so in a place like New York, you know, you may you may be able to, to successfully do what Chef Klaus Meyer has done mm-hmm. and create a Nordic food hall mm-hmm. in Grand mm-hmm. Central Station that is so well, Nordic. Yeah. There's nothing regional about you know the Great Northern Food Hall. It's a, it's a, it's a celebration of uh, you know of Nordic culture. Yeah. Um, yeah. A new food hall is opened up in Brooklyn. That is that is all Japanese. Uh, if you if you uh, took the train out to Queens in the Flushing area, you'd find uh, you'd find food halls that don't have any signs in English. They're all in Chinese. Mm-hmm. Um, so. I guess when you when you, you, you think about it, right? You, you should always think about the terroir where you are. If you're in Omaha, Nebraska, right, mm-hmm. we're doing a project in Omaha, Nebraska. It's thrilling. It's exciting because we can touch all of these local vendors. But instead, the neighborhood is not is not twenty blocks. The neighborhood to draw yeah, and everyone will is, is 2,000 you know, blocks. It, it's it's 200 miles because in that part of the Midwest, uh, things are a little more scattered. Um, but we found excellence in, 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 in vendors and, and excellence in uh, you know things not not surprisingly like craft brewing that are every bit as good mm-hmm. as you mm-hmm. find here. In the you know, the world is so thinking about. Has, just looking at uh, concepts that are experiential and approachable. Um, I'm looking at a couple of the, I'm looking at one of the interesting questions. Yeah. Well, yeah, let, let's, let's, let's talk about what that really means. All right. So experiential is a word that, that gets thrown around an awful lot right now. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm as you mentioned, I'm a lawyer, and so I, I, I'm usually not satisfied with the use of the word unless I really understand it. And so, an experiential moment is is a moment often that that creates uh, mm-hmm. some sort of authentic type of reaction to you. And okay, have we solved that? Um, mm-hmm. I don't think so, right? Because all right, so what does authenticity really mean? Does that mean that somebody uh, gets up in the morning and grinds their own flour and, and creates their own tortilla? And well, maybe it does, but but authenticity, I, I think, is is really best defined, you know, as as the establishment of an intimate connection with what you've just mm-hmm. experienced. So we have to kind of create a circle there. And so if something is, you know, a, a roller coaster ride is experiential. Um, you know, crossing the street in Midtown is experiential. Um, but when I'm, but when all of my senses are activated, which often happens in a food hall, every one of my senses becomes activated in a food hall. Then I've really, I've really touched, you know, a human core. That's that's where we want to go. I think with most of our experiences now. Mm-hmm. Now it's a little cold here. Um, were you going to address one of the Yeah, I was because there was a there was a, a, a good question about um, well quickly do food hall vendors pay their own taxes or does the food hall collect and submit taxes as one entity? Um, well, in most environments, the individual tenants do pay their own taxes, but that is accomplished through an arrangement with the venue operator and. Um, what we try to do in most of those circumstances is to create a uh, you know a platform so that the, uh, the monies which are collected from the sales of food uh, are tracked by uh, what's known as a, a point of sale system, a POS system, and um, and at the end of the day, uh, the vendor knows how much it's sold. Uh, the vendor's going to know how much it's going to owe in sales taxes. And oh, there's a lot of questions to provide that. Um, so it's a sense of that. That's a fear. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, if anybody wants to talk to me about this offline, I'm happy uh, to uh, 
to respond to your questions mm -hmm. uh, because that's a that's a fairly uh, granular explanation about how it's happening. So happy to do that uh, uh, offline. Um, another good question that came up: uh, How does an operator manage quality standards and health code compliance across an array of licenses? That's a great question, mm -hmm. a highly practical question. And what we have seen is that when we have a single venue operator, you're often able to negotiate a single license um, mm. operation within a food hall and all the vendors fall into the unit. We've seen a couple of disasters where there have been, <clears throat> it's one of the reasons why we use license agreements instead of leases, because in many jurisdictions, mm -hmm. if you have a lease, every lease is its own entity, and every entity has to pass the health the health code inspections. Um, it created a disaster in one of the food halls that went up in Brooklyn. So, as I mentioned to you earlier, mm -hmm. uh, and to the to the listening, mm -hmm. food halls is in the United States as a, as a you know as a, as a business model are less than five years old. So we're still learning uh, about what works and what doesn't work. Things that were built four years ago that were state of the art um, are now mm -hmm. used as mm -hmm. examples of so. poorly thought out uh, design. So it changes quickly, but fortunately, um, the changes that we're seeing make them much right. more efficient. I think there is an interest in how yeah. the financials work so for a my, tenant yeah, in a food hall in terms of. Eye, um, it's the a, efficiency if it's creates a, a much license versus a lease, then. Are the individual businesses? Is there some kind of a rev share or something with the the operator of the food hall? Uh -huh. Well, yeah, the, the the venue operators um, as, as will. Uh, with charge a fee, a percentage of sale to the vendors. So for the support that is being provided. And that support is everything from you know cleaning the restaurants, making sure that the common areas are um, are in order, uh, monitoring deliveries, uh, providing security. Um, very importantly, creating a social media presence uh, and a public relations presence for the food hall itself. So there's a lot that a venue operator is charged with doing. Um, there's also um, what would be what would be called rent in a lease scenario is referred to as a usage fee in, in the scenario of license. So there's usually a base fee that the vendor will pay in order to operate. And then there's a percentage of the sales that would go to um, that would go to the venue operator. And and there is a often a built-in percentage rent slash usage fee once the sales reach a certain point. Um, that's common, it's called a break point. And what we try to do though is to take each food hall we work on. And take it from the perspective of a vendor and say, all right, we want the vendor to be able to, at the end of every day, to be able to have made at least 18 to 22% profit. So we kind of do a backwards math approach that way. And that way we're providing the vendor with knowledge that this is, this is our level of expectation. Want to support you in reaching that, but you, Mr. Vendor, mm -hmm. you have to manage your food costs. You have to manage your labor costs. You have to do all the things that a that a restaurant does, but in a micro environment, mm -hmm. um, which often um, is a blessing because you, you you don't lose control of your labor and you don't lose control of your food costs when you're operating in 250 to 300 mm -hmm. square feet. Mm -hmm. um, it gives entrepreneurs the same, I think, better, not the same, 
better opportunity to succeed than what we all thought the food uh, truck model was going to provide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people thought of the food truck as the savior uh, of the small businessman or woman, and it, it, it's not. It, it's, it's a much harder uh, right. roadmap. It's much harder. Plus you have and just the comfort level of yes, being in a, a in a communal trucks, space with everything going on around you as, as versus as out on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, with the sights and sounds, you know, the land of that you're going to get with food hall. And speak, speaking to that, um, one of the things that is a bugaboo for me in, in food halls is I I find it um, a little surprising that more food halls have not yet understood the comfort component of seating. Um, uh, I was recently in a food hall, not to be named, but a very popular food hall, not in New York City, but in an urban environment, um, where I went in at 9 o'clock in the morning to see how the field was. And I, I the first thing that I approached intelligently in the design was the coffee concession and there were lots of people at the coffee concession many of them were moms and toddlers and you can see exactly why it was a communal space where people are going to be able to gather can gather and then our kids can get to know each other and and that was all great except the kids were crawling around on a concrete floor and I thought, well, my goodness, that's not very hospitable. You know, that's not a way to create a loyal community. Can't we think about that when oh, we boy. design? Well, think about it like like this. It, it, it's sort of like a half, you know, a half cooked hamburger. You know, it's it's well, if we don't mm -hmm. finish finish the, the hamburger, we're not going to be able to enjoy it uh, the way it's supposed to be enjoyed. So, in thinking about those things, when we design food and talk about food halls, we talk a lot about comfort. We want you to linger. Unlike uh, unlike in some restaurants, we need to turn tables. Um, in food halls, we need human beings uh, to linger in order to create an environment of community. We want it. That's so nice. Awesome. Makes me want to go to and luckily, I have one close by that's really special. <laughs> but uh, how about uh, what does a vendor need to do to? Well, one of the things that. Um First of all, it's, it's much easier to be able to evaluate whether or not you have a concept that would be food hall friendly from a vendor standpoint um, by visiting some food halls. If you, if you can't visit a food hall, I'm about to hold something up that I hope we can get a look at because this is available online and I would encourage everyone watching this to find it. So it's, it's, a, it's a slight commercial, but it was created before I became part of Christian and Wakefield. Um, I'm holding up a, um, a report, try and center it, called uh, Food Halls of North America. And if you go onto the Cushman and Wakefield uh, website and punch in food halls, uh, you'll be able to get this report. It's, it's about a 20-page report that, as of April uh, of 2018, lists all the food halls that are operating in North America. There are about seven or eight pages of those. Um, but also gives a terrific analysis of what a food hall is and why, it's, what, why the development is so important. Um, I think that you need, uh, if you're going to be a vendor, you need to have, obviously, a controlled menu, um, something that you're able to produce out of a relatively small space, and something that you can produce consistently. One of the things <clears throat> that I know 
and have been thrilled about are that small vendors um, or, or vendors with an idea um, can incubate that idea in a food hall um, without losing their shirt. Um, it usually costs around $50,000, depends where you are, but around $50,000 to get into a stall, which is principally fitted out except for specialty equipment and signage. Um, Within that stall, you can figure out if you're a vendor, how much preparation do I need to do outside of the food hall? How much preparation do I do in my own space? Um, it used to be that food halls were designed with communal kitchens. Um, if there are any chefs uh, listening to this, uh, to this program, um, how would you like to share a common kitchen with 12 other, you know, 12 other different chefs that have nothing to do with what you're doing? It doesn't work. Um, so what we've done is challenge our designers and architects so that to create more spaces within the vending area where, where good solid prep can be done. And again, the designs that have come down in the last two years uh, have made it very, very manageable. There are a couple of food halls that are completely non-vented, and when you and they're non-vented for a reason. So that so that they can attract vendors who mm -hmm. will do all mm -hmm. of their prep offsite. Well, speaking of creativity, um, space do you the day, see how do you uh, see food then, halls contributing uh, I, to innovation uh, in our industry and in food uh, today? Or you know, it's a it's, it's a, a, a big a, a cold, cold, cold uh, a lot of a lot of creativity from the real estate side. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's a great follow-up to what we just talked about, right? So that, so I, I think that food halls um, are are a terrific incubator for equipment, new equipment, more efficient equipment, um, the uh, ability to to uh, continue. To uh, test and experiment with how uh, how tight uh, a venue can become mm -hmm. uh, to make it replicable, um, I think it also creates an environment where most of the people mm -hmm. who are coming to the food hall are already committed to, to to an experimental type of nature. So if that's already a commitment in the mind of the of the person coming into the food hall, oh, I'm going to try something today I've never tried before. Well, that's going to give the vendor the freedom uh, to push an envelope from a, you know, from a, a menu standpoint, preparation mm -hmm. standpoint. Um, should we create, uh, you know, should we create new foods, uh, new types of foods uh, for food halls? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But can we create ways to prepare the food um, that is mm -hmm. going to make the transaction uh, between uh, the customer and the vendor more seamless? Um, I guess McDonald's figured that out right a long time ago um, mm -hmm. that they can they mm -hmm. can create uh, a replicable experience in many different places and and that's a great thing for a lot of folks but what's more important I think in, in the environments that we we find ourselves in is that I want mm -hmm. to be able to replicate that mm -hmm. dish mm -hmm. in that space a hundred times in a day right not necessarily you know, 20 billion sold, but I want to be able to replicate a good, a good experience from my menu each day, and so the, the ability to hone that craft um, is inherent uh -huh. in, a, uh, in operating out. Seamless and efficient, and, and yeah, install. yeah, in every way. But equipment, equipment. If you're going to ask me the one thing that is going to be uh, that's going to come out of this, that's going to be really exciting. It's going to be the equipment that is going to be developed. Make that transaction more seamless, and I see it every day. And and, and it's it's right, right. Um, yes, so that's uh, to me that's really so many exciting. different things I talked to, a, a, to a, a, a pizza oven designer uh, recently who was able to actually create a wood burning pizza oven that is literally twenty, you know, 
80 percent smaller than traditional pizza ovens and he did it because he was inspired by food hall design other than pizza, right? In those kind of wood-fired ovens. So very popular, very popular style. Um, is Do you think food halls are just as appropriate for launching new food products, food packaged products, retail products, as they are for concepts in terms of food service types of concepts? Yeah. Yes. Yep. It's um, look. Wood, we all know that wood fire, charcoal fire, uh, it, you know, imports a, uh, a flavor that is is not replicable you know, for baking or sautéing. Um, whether it's the best way to prepare food, I'll leave it. I'll leave it to the uh, uh, to the person who's eating it. But it is certainly. Uh, it's part again of that sensory experience that you're that you're often trying to get. Um, you know, fire is still one of the most exciting things to watch in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if my last question uh, made it through. I had a little freezing there, I guess. Um, but I was wondering what your thoughts are on launching a new food uh, packaged product or retail product. At a food hall environment, and is that an appropriate environment to launch a product like that in addition to a food service type concept? Well, um, I'm going to tell you that I cannot think of a better environment to provide a packaged product than a food hall. Again, we talk go back to design. Most of the food halls that we work on, we design them so that there can be pop-up retail of all mm -hmm. kinds within the food hall. It helps with the programming. Um, we want not only the vendors to be able to sell their sauces, so it's, it's, it's almost common now, right? If, you're, if, if, if you have a restaurant, you have to have a hot sauce that you're selling. Well, right. they're fun, but there are also baked goods that can be sold. There are all kinds of things that can be food products that can be and should be sold in food halls. And kiosks, uh, movable kiosks that feature these items. Um, if I were one of the people in the, in the food biz program that had an item and wanted to package it, I couldn't think of a better testing ground than to be able to sell it um, and let people taste it in a food hall. Mm -hmm. Again, the food hall is a laboratory in and of itself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's exactly where I want it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, you know, we can take it in all kinds of directions. But we talk about exactly this point in the retail community, the non-food community, saying food is such an important um, experiential moment right now that we should be thinking about these food halls. Um, as places for pop-up retailers mm -hmm. to show their new products, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether they're, uh, you know, whether they are, uh, whether it's clothing, uh, whether it is, uh, we just had a meeting about a group that wanted, literally, wanted to use the food hall at night to race drones. Race because drones. it would have been an interesting, <laughs> yeah, because it would have been an interesting obstacle uh -huh. and a great thing to film. So what can happen in a food hall, um, you know, the, the, the limits are your own imagination. But I'm a big believer that that that, um, that taking a chance uh, with new products, uh, whether they be food uh, or whether they be traditional retail products within food hall space mm -hmm. is a really great way to get your products launched. Well, which really, I think, just takes us kind of full circle back to the idea of a food hall being a community gathering place where all kinds of activities can take place with uh, local community and groups of people who want to want to have a place to gather. Yeah, we uh, we have that fine line, right? Of, of we want to give you something that that you were 
that is going to make you feel comfortable, and we want to be able to surprise you every day with something else. So it's, it, is a, it is an odd line where we want to program so that you know consistently that on Thursday, you know, the, 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 best, the best cheese mongers in the area are going to be here. Mm -hmm. You know Thursday is cheese day, mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't mind surprising you by having a drone drop, you know, drop some of the, some of the cheese onto a table <laughs> and say, come back tonight and, and watch the drones race. You know, it's, it's, yeah. Very exciting. Well, thank you so much, Phil. Any last comments that you'd like to make or last words of wisdom about food halls to our audience? Um, the last thing I want to say about food halls is that they are going to be an important approach to dining in this country for many years going forward. Um, I believe it's a good thing. Um, I believe that our, uh, uh, our generations that are going to follow ours um, are going to be focused on experiences with their food <clears throat> that are going to do more than, than nourish them from a standpoint of uh, feeling satiated. They're going to want uh, and they're going to demand and they'll be loyal to uh, a, a, a food offering that is, uh, that is provided with integrity, honestly, that is not gouging anyone, mm -hmm. uh, that is not going to make them fumble around and wonder how much they should tip. Um, an environment where they can control what they want um, within, a, within a nice communal environment that, uh, you know, that for the most part, they're going to continue to recognize as a place that they're going to see their friends and their families. Well, what a wonderful opportunity for all of our listeners to think about for future careers, business opportunities, and just for improving all of our lifestyles. I'll tell any chef out there that's interested that if they can do a, uh, if they can do one vending station right, There'll be the opportunity to do five more before your year is out uh, with other groups. That's how fast this is growing, um, and that's how popular the concept is. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, for welcome. the listeners, I am going to talk to you just for a moment about our upcoming programs. And, Phil, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening. You. Bye. So everyone, as you can see on the slide here on the screen, we will have our next Food Biz Plus session on January 18th. It will be Food Biz Plus the New Retail Landscape with Brooke Golden, who is the Vice President of Navitas Organics. Brooke is actually also a professor, like Phil, in our new master's degree program, uh, teaching all about packaging and differentiation and marketing of food products. So we're uh, very excited to have her joining us on January 18th. And secondly, I'd like to just tell you a little bit uh, briefly about our new Masters of uh, Professional Studies in Food Business program here at the CIA through the Bo Food Business School. It's a master's degree in food business, very much like an MBA, but totally focused on food business and the business of food. It's a two-year program that's totally intended to be undertaken by people who are working professionals. So it's designed to be able to be uh, mastered and taken while you're working uh, over a period of two years online from wherever your location happens to be. So you can um, work at your leisure in an asynchronous format with our faculty in a cohort environment and achieve your master's degree in just uh, two years with uh, an a not online cohort. So it's uh, designed for anybody who is looking to change their career, advance their career, or perhaps start their own entrepreneurial food business. We're very excited to offer this program, and it's uh, very well uh, respected even uh, in its infancy. So it includes uh, an active mentor network as part of the program, uh, residencies that are short-term as part of the program, 
program, but the bulk of the program is online and can be completed from wherever you wherever you happen to be located. So if you are interested in this program, this is just a schematic of it, you will find all of these documents on the website. And you can most easily get to the website at foodbusinessschool.org where you'll see a banner about the program that says learn more. And you can get to directly to the master's degree website. You can also find it under the academic section of ciachef.edu. And there will be contact information. I would be more than happy to speak with any of you who might be interested in this master's program. Our next cohort will be starting in fall of 2019. And we will be reviewing applications beginning February 1st. So please, if you're interested, uh, check out the website, get your application in before February 1st, and be in touch if you have any questions.